In 1981, movie producer Irvin Winkler optioned the screenwrites to tell the life story of legendary American composer George Gershwin. Martin Scorsese would make preparations to direct the biopic from a screenplay by writer and collaborator Paul Schrader. Schrader had previously scripted Scorsese's Taxi Driver and Raging Bull, and later The Last Temptation of Christ and Bringing Out the Dead. For Gershwin, it was intended that there would be lavish production numbers of the composer's work that would be related to scenes from his life discussed by Gershwin on a psychologist's couch. Despite the enthusiasm and completed script, the project stalled early on, said to be due in no small part to the disappointing box office and initial underwhelming reviews for Scorsese's and Schrader's Raging Bull. It would remain on Scorsese's mind for over a decade, and the screenplay would later receive a major revision by playwright John Guire. The project had hoped to see Daniel Day-Lewis starring as Gershwin, alongside Tom Hanks as Ira Gershwin, George's older brother, collaborator, and a renowned lyricist and composer in his own right. After work on the final draft was completed and handed in, then Warner Brothers chief, Terry Semmel, refused to believe that there was a sufficient enough modern interest in the life of Gershwin to greenlight a lavish musical. Scorsese was disappointed with the decision, having lived with the idea for so long, and would say, I had worked on a script with Erwin Winkler. Paul Schrader was first, and then John Guire on the subject of Gershwin for many years. That was the first film I owed Warner Brothers. It's a complicated issue. Ultimately, when it was time to do Gershwin, they turned to me and said, we'd rather have one on Dean Martin. I said, the thing is, the Gershwin script is done. Excuse me, I'm just saying, it's been since 1981 I've been working on it. They said, no, 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 no. I understood. They wanted something from the swinging early 60s, late 50s Vegas-like Ocean's Eleven. The original Ocean's Eleven. Screenwriter Nicholas Pelledri spoke to Variety, saying his own dream cast would include Tom Hanks as Martin, John Travolta as Sinatra, Hugh Grant as Lawford, Adam Sandler as Bishop, and Jim Carrey as Jerry Lewis. Hanks was the first star to be cast in the title role. Hanks had previously portrayed Martin for laughs in a 1990 Saturday Night Live sketch, singing a duet with Carl Sagan, as played by Mike Myers. Hanks was already known as a big fan of Dean Martin and would speak of his admiration to the BBC. All right, Dean Martin was the epitome of adult smoothness. Grown-ups uh, in my life were divided into two very distinctive camps. The bigger camp was Frank Sinatra. The smaller camp was Dean Martin. And his television show in the United States was him in a tuxedo, in a groovy apartment, chatting with people over a piano, and <laughs> hearing relaxez-vous for the first time with Lean Reno. There's a line in here that is the most unhip lyric I have ever heard in any song everywhere, which is... Let's put on our sneakers and slacks and relax a boo. There's nothing more incongruous. <laughs> Dean Martin doesn't talk about sneakers and slacks, but you could just see him there saying, hey, I don't care what the line is. Let's just lay it down and record the thing. Put on your sneakers and slacks <laughs> and relax a boo. Nicholas Pelledger's script was in large part based on Nick Tosh's 1992 Dean Martin biopic, Dino living high in the dirty business of dreams. The book is as much a breakdown of the American myth-making machinery as it is a celebrity biography through his chronicles of Martin's escapades, scandals, inebriations, and eventual divorce from public life. The writer exposes some of the emptiness at the core of fame, saying, what I really wanted to do with the book was to get to the heart of the thing called popular culture the heart of this great delusion that is show business. At one point, he stopped going to his movies, and then he stopped listening to records he made. He seemed to have been very successful at erasing the world around him. He never read a book in his life. He has no desire to communicate anything or be communicated to. Martin had declined to be interviewed for the book. I won't interview him if he doesn't interview me, was the final dismissal relayed to the author. Dino is a meticulous document, 
The back of the book contains more than 100 pages of source materials and notes. In addition to the interviews and dozens of Mr. Martin's friends, associates, wives, and golf partners, there's lots of fanatically researched print reviews, court documents, articles, and materials from government files. Reviews were positive upon the book's launch, and the publisher reported strong sales. Discussing his affinity with Martin, the book's author said, I would describe Dean as a noble character in an ignoble racket in an ignoble age. He made out his role in American culture, and American culture itself as basically a racket. In his own way, he seemed to be a man who lived by a code. Whether or not that code was light or dark, he seemed to live by it. He seemed to possess a certain honesty that's very rare, and he managed to keep the world at bay and not interfere with the business of his being, whatever that was. Life is a racket. Writing is a racket. Serenity is a racket. Everything's a racket. In conclusion, we learn that Dean Martin, star of stage, screen, and television variety hour, spent most of his time alone in a big house in the Bel Air section of Los Angeles, watching old cowboy pictures. He did not socialize, nor attend photo opportunities and charity appearances. He did not release multi-CD box sets in honor of his Diamond Jubilee. In fact, he seemed utterly content and comfortable to let the phantom of his fame slip away. And it's this lack of scandal, conflict, and inner torment that would lead to the script fading out of Scorsese's schedule. Despite having already cast Tom Hanks in the role, the director said shortly after, we really tried, but the story of Dean Martin is very difficult. It's very difficult because ultimately he pulls back in life. He seemed to pull back in life. He pulled back and seemed to be passive, and that was part of what was appreciated about him from Sinatra and everybody else. The active ones were Sinatra and Sammy Davis. They were making things. They were out there and taking people on, and Frank Sinatra would see somebody in a bar that had written something about him that he didn't like, and Dean would say, leave him alone. Don't give him the satisfaction. Let it be. No, he was going to get up and hit him. It's interesting, it's an interesting dynamic, but you can't make a film and say what the man is about. I don't think you can ever make a fiction or even a documentary. You could, maybe. I keep thinking this, you could maybe. If you're lucky, have the contradictions in a man or a woman, that makes the person, but you can't say this is the kind of person he was and this is who he is, like Howard Hughes. This is an aspect of Howard Hughes. We really couldn't get a handle on what to do. I actually thought the strongest story there, beyond the Rat Pack thing, before that was his relationship with Jerry Lewis, and the creative relationship and how that worked out. Ultimately, having gone through such fame, having such a close working relationship, how he then pulled back creatively, seemingly, and had gone through such a close relationship like a marriage. That's a very strong thing. That's really the story, I think. And it's the story of creative collaboration, whether you're writers or painters or composers, magicians, anything, filmmakers, comedians, this is it. This is the story of two people and how they work together over the years. As late as 2004, Dean Martin's daughter, Diana, gave interviews saying she hoped that the project would regain momentum and that the biography about her father will be made into a movie eventually, and that if Hanks, or her previous preference George Clooney, wasn't available, then Johnny Depp would be an ideal casting. When contacted for a comment, Scorsese replied that as far as he was concerned, the project was dead. Speaking later that year during the press tour of The Aviator, Scorsese elaborated on the matter, saying, There was talk, a lot of it. We did it. Tom Hanks was going to do it. Nick Pelleggi and I killed ourselves working on that script. I always use that phrase, killed, since I'm always accused of being overly dramatic by everyone. But we really suffered making that one. You do feel as if you were in a battle, you know? But in any event, when the time came, we accepted the assignment to try and do it. There were legal issues involved, too. I don't remember half of it. But all I know is that Nick and I tried for a year on the script. And it's exactly the same situation as Howard Hughes' story. I didn't know what to leave out. I just didn't know what to leave out. And that would be that. The proposed movie would lay dormant, although much of the research gathered during this period would be of great help to Scorsese in preparing the next one. 
On the 13th of May, 2009, film critic Bruce Kirkland began spreading the news that Tina Sinatra, Frank Sinatra's youngest daughter, together with Martin Scorsese, was to produce and film a major motion picture biopic on the life of Frank Sinatra. Tina Sinatra would join the filmmakers in the capacity as producer and consultant, announcing, Marty has always wanted to do this. Tina Sinatra, who also produced the 1992 miniseries Sinatra, said Scorsese was in a reflective period and was willing to present the truth about her father, who died on May the 14th, 1998. Tina Sinatra said, He never drove the getaway car, so in the forthcoming Universal picture film, I don't want him to be driving the getaway car. That would not be fair, but I trust Scorsese implicitly. Tina Sinatra admitted it is premature to officially announce Scorsese for the biopic. Initially, she referred to the director as the most prominent Italian-American filmmaker working today in Hollywood. Official confirmation swiftly followed, reading, Universal Pictures acquiring of Sinatra after commissioning a script by Field of Dreams, screenwriter Phil Olden Robinson came after years of negotiations with Frank Sinatra Enterprises, a joint venture of the Crooners Estate and Warner Music Group. Sinatra, have you talked DiCaprio into playing Frank Sinatra? For We're the talking about it. We're talking about it. <laughs> well, you, know, you guys are here. You're in the same hotel. Uh, when's the last conversation? This morning? When? Breakfast? Uh, last week. Last week. What did he say? Yeah. Now we're talking about it. Does it really boil down to whether or not he can handle the singing? In a case like that, you can't have anyone sing Sinatra songs. You have to use Sinatra's voice. Well, then, 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 he, then he's off the hook. This is yeah, perfect. Exactly. I mean, you know, if you go in, you know, Joaquin Phoenix did no. Johnny Cash. No, no, I can't. You can't. Not, the, not, not Frank Sinatra. It has to you be. Can't run that. <laughs> <laughs> it has to be the man. It's got to right be the to... man. It's got to be the chairman of the board. You can't. This is the, he's the king. You can't do anything about that. That's. That's going to be pretty interesting. Could you do it without Leo if he finally says, you know what, Marty, no, can't do it? Well, I mean, in a case like that, depending on the nature of the script, if, you know, uh, it's something that uh, uh, obviously if I really want to make the picture, I guess I'll find a way. Internal politics of the estate, where family members had to form a consensus as to how to tell the story and, more importantly, just how much of the story to tell, was a hurdle that had to be overcome. The director signed the paperwork and Martin Scorsese's Sinatra would be entering pre-production at some point during the year. Tina Sinatra would be an executive producer along with writer Robinson and Gary Lamell, the former president of Warner Bros. Music Division and himself a musician. The producers were to be Peter Guber and his executive, Kathy Shulman. This has been a passion project for Peter Guber for a long time, said Shulman. And first, he got together with the Sinatra estate, and then with Scorsese, who's also a huge Sinatra fan. Peter Guber issued a statement saying, We have dreamt of making a movie about Frank Sinatra, and Marty Scorsese is undeniably the perfect vision keeper for this project. Tina Sinatra went on to record saying, my father had great admiration for the talent of the people he chose to work with, and the talented people who worked with my father had great admiration for him. It is personally pleasing to me that this paradigm continues with Martin Scorsese at the helm of the Sinatra film. The new producer said this movie wouldn't be another Goodfellas or Casino, and that the legendary singer-actor, who allegedly socialized with crime figures, would be shown as innocent of any true involvement with the Mafia or other gangsters that Scorsese's film would finally put to bed those scurrilous rumors. Scorsese was initially bombarded by speculations on who should, would, and could be cast in the main roles. Scorsese teased the idea of casting an actor to play a young Sinatra in his Jersey days, and then cutting to an older Sinatra and Dean Martin in the later years of the Rat Pack and their subsequent reunions. Scorsese was told that Sinatra's daughter liked the idea of casting George Clooney to portray her father. Scorsese responded, I'm yet to spot the actor who can bring back Frank Sinatra alive on screen. My choice is Al Pacino and Robert De Niro as Dean Martin. As the time period the screenplay would cover began to expand, Leonardo DiCaprio started to seem the likely choice, 
Hollywood insiders printed that DiCaprio had been attached from the start and Scorsese wouldn't commit without the actor's participation. Other sources suggested DiCaprio was publicly distancing himself from all talk of bringing Sinatra to screen, acknowledging the decision was out of his hands. During the press tour of the movie, J. Edgar, director Clint Eastwood, told the press that DiCaprio was already to play Frank Sinatra in another Scorsese biopic. This is in Mr. Scorsese's hands. Eastwood said, I'm always incredibly game for anything that he decides to do. MTV would then contact DiCaprio for his thoughts on the matter. Asked if the rumor mill had gotten it right, DiCaprio responded saying, I don't know, I have no idea. That's really up to Scorsese and the people involved with Sinatra's estate. And uh, still have Leo in mind for Sinatra? Would you? Yes, I do, but uh, we're starting again with a new script. Okay. And so that should begin, I hope, in January, February. Can Scripting. I, can I ask who's tackling the script on that? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> has it, does he have the chops to sing? Would you have him sing as himself? I. That's a good question. I think. Um, uh, I think. I don't know. I, I think that there's no one that could. I mean, how do you? Yeah, <laughs> no one that could t do that. You wouldn't accept it. I think. I think it has to be recorded. Yeah. The recorded music. That would be my first instinct. Gotcha. And how to make that work without just looking like lip syncing scenes. Right, right. You know, how to shoot it. Right. You know, to make it, uh, to you know it's Sinatra's voice, right. you know it isn't him up there at that moment, yet it's interesting for narratively. Uh, you buy whatever's happening there, you know what I'm saying? Right. It isn't just a medium shot of a guy, a guy singing pretending to be Sinatra. Right, right. Okay. Uh, what are we going to do? <laughs> the novelty's you know, lost quickly. Yeah, it's yeah. gone. So, DiCaprio was asked if he had the vocal chops to pull off the iconic role. He replied, Oh, I can sing like Sinatra, man, definitely. Can't everyone. Scorsese was then asked which actor would he love to work with next. Scorsese answered, Johnny Depp is one. I like him. He's unique. I don't know how he does it. George Clooney, Brad Pitt is interesting, and Tobey Maguire. There's a lot of good people. Are you talking to any of them right now? Asked the interviewer. Maybe about the Frank Sinatra project? Scorsese wouldn't be engaged on details, replying, Not right now, no. And we're still working on the Sinatra script. It's very hard because here is a man who changed the entire image of the Italian American. And that's just one thing, along with his political work, civil rights, the mob. I was hoping it would be a combination of Goodfellas and The Aviator. Yeah, because in structure, I'd like it to be more like Goodfellas. But like The Aviator, it only deals with certain times in his life. We can't go through the greatest hits of Sinatra's life. We tried this already, just can't do it. So the other way to go is to have three or four different Sinatras. Younger, older, middle-aged, very old. You cut back and forth in time and you do it through the music. See what I'm saying? So that's what we're trying for. It's very tricky. There were also complicated rights issues, with the entire venture at one point getting bogged down over merchandising rights, which the studio and the family were haggling over. The issue appeared to be resolved at the time. The obstacles were ones of comfort and trust, Shulman said. Everybody that was in control of the rights had to anonymously agree to this, and having Marty at the head of this was the thing that ultimately cracked the code, so to speak. Robinson, who was nominated for an Oscar for writing 1989's Field of Dreams, had amassed 30,000 pages of notes and research for Sinatra, and distilling it into a feature film led the creative team to shun a traditional linear storytelling approach in favor of a more unconventional one. It'll be almost like a collage, Shulman said, in the way one of his records captures different rhythms and moods. This will have collective scenes and moments that form the overall story as opposed to a conventional timeline. It's about capturing moments as opposed to trying to tell the entire story in too little time. Time would pass, and Sinatra remained without a start date or final draft that could be unanimously agreed upon. Other projects would come and go in the meantime. Scorsese would work with DiCaprio on Shutter Island, and 2011 saw the release of Hugo. 
Powerhouse producer Scott Rudin would join production and yet still time would continue to drag on as the debate over the direction, tone and the depiction of an on-screen Sinatra seemed to be going around in endless circles. Universal Pictures hired State of Play writer Billy Ray to revise a fresh Sinatra script in 2012. Ray had recently worked on the script for The Hunger Games and Paul Greengrass's Captain Phillips and was eager to take the screenplay to the next level it needed to be at to hopefully, finally, get made. Scorsese was now off making The Wolf of Wall Street. A new script was soon handed in, but the old sticking point still remained. How exactly would Scorsese tell the story he wanted to tell, with the inclusion and exploration of the actual man, of Sinatra's darker side, as well as tell the story that would appease his daughters and instead exclusively present an old blue eyes as seen and heard on stage by his untold millions of fans and as remembered by his family? Scorsese refused to budge, and his interest moved over to finally making the 17th century Jesuit priest drama Silence. Chatting with Entertainment Tonight, Scorsese revealed the Sinatra movie was still moving forward, but his life story is so sprawling that the plan is to try and hone in on a specific era, saying, I'm talking to one or two writers now. The problem is the biography. Where do you start? I met this writer who I think could do a lot with it, but we have to get hold of the story. It's too unwieldy. I'd love to tell the whole story, but the idea of art is to figure out where to start because we can't tell his whole life story. Asked if he could take it to HBO and do it as a miniseries, he offered that was a possibility. And when asked about Leonardo DiCaprio as Frank, Scorsese said, Leo's always talked about doing it, but what if the story takes you in a completely different way? We could go for an unknown. Maybe the person who plays him isn't important. Maybe it's distracting to have a star in that role. Yet you can't have someone else sing. It's got to be Sinatra's voice. It's tricky. It's filled with problems. And whatever you do, there's always going to be people who don't like it. So you have to find something special. And I think I found it. Now's the time to execute it on the page. The something special in question was a 1966 Esquire article titled Frank Sinatra Has a Cold, written by the acclaimed journalist Gay Talese. The article is one of the most famous pieces of magazine journalism ever written and is often considered not only to be the greatest profile on Frank Sinatra, but one of the greatest celebrity profiles ever written. The profile is one of the seminal works of new journalism and is still widely read, discussed and studied. Talese wrote the illuminating profile after Sinatra refused the interview. The writer would instead speak to the star's entourage of friends and associates and would compile a look at Frank as seen from those who know him up close and personal. And Hayes, Mr. Hayes, Harold Hayes said no. We can do Sinatra. Oh, come on, Harold, you don't want to do Sinatra. Everybody's done it. Life, Life Magazine had a piece two months before, and Look has got another scheduled piece. No, no, we, it's easy. We have a cover. You don't have a cover. This is a cover for you. Easy. Go out there. The press agent, Jim Mahoney is by his name, will see you. We stay at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. You can have some fun out there, better weather, and Sinatra will see you Monday. You fly out Saturday or Sunday or whatever and see you Monday. And after you finish that piece, it should be easy. Then come back and you do Clifton Daniel, the New York Times guy you want to read. I said, okay. And I, of course, flew out, fully expected it would be easy, set up, cover story. And this press agent is going to be leading me to the great man himself. And I tell you, I'm not going to sound un uh, without a certain uh, expectation. I had never seen Sinatra. I had grown up with Sinatra. I could almost memorize some of the great songs word for word. No. I'd never seen him. So I was looking forward to that. But I didn't see him because the Monday when I called the press agent, this whole change of story, what happened was Sinatra has a cold, said the press agent. So I said, okay, so a couple days later, I'll get over the cold and we'll do this piece. Well, and not so fast, the press agent said, this was over the phone. I've been calling from the hotel Beverly Wilshire, as I said before. Frank has second thoughts about this. Why? Well, 
This Walter Cronkite in CBS, we hear, is delving into Frank's alleged connection to organized crime figures. I said, Jim, the Jim Mahoney. I said, Jim, I'm not doing that. I'm going to do Frank Sinatra, Man and His Music. NBC's has this big spectacular coming out called Frank Sinatra, Man and His Music. In about two, I'm going to talk about his music and what his life is like and, you know, hang around with him a little bit. So I thought. Jim said, I'm, uh, Mahoney said, I'm afraid the lawyer here believes that we want to see the piece. Oh, come on, Jim, you can't do it. I couldn't do it at the New York Times. I can't do it at Esco. I can't do it anywhere. You can't do that. No. That's it. Well, then maybe you should go back to New York. I thought, wow, not so bad yeah, idea. Good idea. Well, yeah, I'm ready to go. <laughs> oh, right. I said, well, listen, I have to call the editor about this. But you want, you're saying I have to submit this? Yes, we would like it for accuracy. I said, I'll be accurate. No, but we want to be sure you don't put in things that we don't want you to put in. I said, well, I'll call the editor and tell him what you said. I called the editor and said, Harold, we can't, of course we can't do this. So do you, what Think can I? Think final approval of, yeah, of your story. you can't do it. I said, well, what do you want to do? I said, well, I can, I can come home, or if you want, I'll go to a cheaper hotel. I'll hang around. I can talk to a lot of other people that know Sinatra, because he's not going to talk to me anyway. And I'll, see, and I'll let's see what happens. I'll spend a week. You don't have to move to a better hotel, uh, less less expensive hotel. Said they wouldn't say this today, but here in 1966, <laughs> stay stay at the four five star Beverly Wilshire, keep your rented car, uh, take people to lunch and dinner. So I started taking people, not renowned personalities, but people on the margin of a superstar's life, such as musicians that maybe played in orchestras that where Sinatra was a solo singer at one time or another, like the Tommy Dorsey band or the right. Harry James. This is all world, post-World War II period stuff you're hearing, of course. And maybe actresses that were in movies, who Sinatra made a lot of movies, and, or dancers or people who used to date or people, it was his tailor, for example, long, not across far from the Beverly Wilshire Hotel, was a tailor shop called, called Dick Carroll's. Dick Carroll made suits for Sinatra. I woke to one day and Sinatra said, I mean, Dick Carroll said, Oh, we make, on average, we're always making two, two tuxedos for Frank Sinatra, automatically. Always. Always making two, because he, he's about 100 tuxedos, but you, you always have to have extra tuxedos on the road with this man. I met another woman who said, oh, he wears toupees. You know that? I said, yes. She says, well, I carry 60 toupees around in a little satchel. She so carries we, what? 60 toupees of Frank Sinatra. 60. 660. In a, in, a, in a satchel on the road with him. I said, this really? is her job. That's her job. And she told toupee. me, making, in those days, I'm making $500 a week or something like that. This is, doesn't sound like much now. But in those days, it's a pretty good job for doing the little like How did you meet her? How did you find I her? I met her through one of the persons I knew in, in um, Beverly Hills was a restaurant owner. The restaurant was called The Daisy. The Daisy. It's, very it's the, famous. First, the first scene of the, yeah. of the story is in The Daisy. And that guy, Jack Hansen, was the owner. And I had known him from a previous trip, and he was very friendly, and his wife was very friendly. And, and this guy, Jack Hansen, said, you know, Frank has, wears toupees. I said, well, I heard that. He really does. In fact, he said there's a woman that does nothing but carry his toupees around. Really? And I, I said, I say, how would I reach her? He said, well, you know, I, I think I know somebody who knows her. And so we, that's how I met her. The profile begins with Sinatra in a sullen mood at a private Hollywood club. Stressed about all the events in his life, Sinatra and many of his staff are in poor mood because Sinatra is afflicted by the common cold, hampering his ability to sing. The significance of the cold is expressed by Talese in one of the story's most famous passages. Sinatra with a cold is Picasso without paint, Ferrari without fuel, only worse. For the common cold robs Sinatra of that uninsurable jewel his voice, cutting into the core of his confidence, and it affects not only his own psyche, but also seems to cause a kind of psychosomatic nasal drip within dozens of people who work for him, drink with him, love him, depend on him for their own welfare and stability. A Sinatra with a cold can, in a small way, send vibrations through the entertainment industry and beyond, as surely as a president of the United States, suddenly sick, can shake the national economy. The Sinatra estate purchased the rights to the article, and writer Michael Shabon was then hired and brought on board to adapt and expand the piece into a whole new draft. 
The production now hoped that this new angle would finally get the project kit started. Frank Sinatra has a cold is not quite a rose-tinted view of Sinatra, but it gives us much insight into the sort of moments the filmmakers were hoping to capture and the elements of Sinatra's private life that could lend themselves to dramatic on-screen conflict. While Sinatra was near the heights of his fame in the 1960s, the world of music was changing. The arrivals of bands like the Beatles and the accompanying culture change was threatening to Sinatra. One key moment in the article, and one that would no doubt become an unintentionally and absurdly comic set piece in the final screenplay, is the scene with the writer Harlan Ellison, who is wearing game warden boots, corduroy slacks, a Shetland sweater, and a tan suede jacket in a club. Sinatra confronts and insults Ellison about his clothing. After Ellison is cajoled into leaving the room, Sinatra tells the assistant manager, I don't want anybody in here without coats and ties. We had this, uh, this really ugly scene in which I wound up laying out his bodyguard with a pool cue. Sinatra shows up with a coterie. And the room was filled. It was a Friday or a Saturday night, and everybody was anybody was in, was in town. And they, they go to the Daisy because it was the in club. I had gotten into it. I was destitute, but I had finessed my way into a membership, which is another story that involves Aaron Spelling, but we won't go into that story because it takes it too far back. And he comes in. Now, this is in the height of the Carnaby Street dressing. And I'm wearing, and I still got them, a pair of soft... Deer, uh, 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 deer stalker boots that, like Robin Hood, they come up and they fold over. Really handsome, soft brown leather. And in walks Sinatra, who is dressed like a Kansas City hitman. <laughs> the black, the black right. suit, the narrow wingtip shoes, the little, the little black uh, uh, hanging judge tie, and and the white on white uh, mafioso uh, shirt. And uh, in with him comes a bunch of other people, all of whom are in his thrall. So uh, I'm shooting pool with uh, with Leo de Rocher and Omar. In comes uh, old Blue Eyes, and I had always adored him. I mean, I loved his music for Christ. I grew up on Sinatra. How can you not love it? And he sits down, and for some inexplicable reason, had, having nothing to do, I didn't say a word to him. I didn't know him. Never met him. He starts he starts cranking on me, and uh, and he is fronting me pretty pretty severely and he starts off I mean I'm not going to go into the whole thing because it's all in the article yeah. uh, which is written by Gay Talese of course who was one of the great gonzo journalists of our time and uh, he says uh, are those Spanish boots I didn't know who the hell he was talking about. I'm busy working the table and somebody nudges me and said S Mr. Sinatra is talking to you I look over and I said yeah he said are those Spanish boots I said no and I go back to another shot, and about two minutes go by, and you got to understand, I ran over from home when I was 13. I was riding boxcars. I was driving a dynamite truck in North Carolina when I was 14. I know when somebody is fronting me. I know when somebody is trying to jack me up, and I know right from the get-go. When he did the Spanish boots, I hadn't yet got it, but about a minute and a half later, he says, are those Italian boots? Now I know he's fucking with me, right. and I say, no in that tone no and uh go walking around the table and everybody in the room is silent because there is an ominousness when you when you see something like this taking shape and they nobody wanted to get in his way nobody right and uh he said uh, uh are those english boots <laughs> and they were and i said why are you talking to me do we know each other? And he says, I don't like the way you're dressed. I said, people in hell want ice water. It don't mean shit to me. <laughs> now, everybody in the room is saying, Ellison is going to die. <laughs> Ellison is going to turn up as part of the 503 freeway. <laughs> um, my big mouth and I are, are, are always getting me in trouble. And I'm Without the fear gag reflex, you wind up doing shit you would never in your right mind do. So here I am talking back to fucking Frank Sinatra. 
and uh, who, who I know has hired guys to beat the crap out of other guys, or he can get me killed at the studio. And, and it goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on with him making remarks. And then he, asked, he, says, uh, he says, what do you do? Well, I said, uh, I'm a plumber. Jimmy Boyd says to Sinatra, he's not a plumber. He's a movie writer. He wrote the Oscar. Well, the Oscar had just finished shooting, and Sinatra had a role in it. And uh, Sin he, had a, he had a guest cameo. So Sinatra says, well, I've seen it. It's a piece of shit. And I said, well, it takes shit to know shit. And I said, um, since the movie hasn't been released, it's kind of amusing to me that you've seen it already. But you're in it. So you're shit and shit. And what do you think of that? Well, <laughs> he starts to get off the chair, but he wouldn't fight me on his own. At that moment, Brad Dexter comes in from the other room because somebody had gone in and told him, he was sitting with Dean Martin, apparently, and the rest of the entourage, Frank is bagged. Frank is behaving badly. Go get Frank. Now, Brad Dexter was a behemoth. He was gigantic. <laughs> he was built well. And you know, you know how he became Sinatra's bodyguard? He saved Sinatra's life. They were doing um, Hell in the Pacific or whatever the hell that fucking stupid movie was that Sinatra directed. Uh, uh, Dexter comes in and says, uh, Frank, and Sinatra says to him, and of course it's dead quiet in the room. He says, why are you interrupting me? Can't you see I'm talking to this guy? Which is the code. Take over. So now Dexter comes around. And he says, uh, come on, why don't you leave? And I said, what do you mean, why don't I leave? I have a membership, I'm a member here. He said, well, Frank doesn't like the way you're dressed. I said, I don't like the way Frank is dressed. <laughs> and, 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 and Sinatra's saying something from, the back, from behind him. And I say, hey, you, shut the fuck up. Dexter comes around the table and he grabs the pool cue. And I just lift it up like this and go, boom, right in the solar plexus, right here. And he went over the table. Well, now... Everybody goes bug fuck because now it has escalated to violence. And in comes Jack Hansen, who was the owner. Jack Hansen uh, owned Jack's Slacks, big famous thing, loved to fuck young girls and models and shit like that. Had a wonderful wife, but he was busy fucking them all the time. And uh, Jack said, I'm not going to have this here. I'm not going to have this here. And they drag Sinatra, literally drag Sinatra by the armpits into the next room. Now Jack says, you got to get out of here. And he says, you know, you don't come back to the club for a week. And I said, I'll talk to you tomorrow. And I went home. <laughs> well, about a week or so later, uh, other things happened to me, the threats, the phone calls, all this and all that and all the blah, blah, blah. And Jack Hansen comes out and he says, do you know who um, uh, Gay Talese is? Well, this was soon after Gay Talese's book, uh, New York, A Serendipitous Journey, came out. And I said, of course I know who Gay he's, he's magnificent. He said, well, he's sitting inside and he'd like to talk to you. I said, me? What the hell does he want to talk to me about? He said, I don't know. So I go in and there sits Gay Talese. I recognize him immediately. That, and he says, listen, I hear you had a little fight with uh, Frank Sinatra in here a week or so ago. I said, eh, it's no big deal. It's bullshit. He said, well, tell me about it. And I said, mm, uh, he said, come on, come on, tell me. So I told, I told him what I've just told you, but in more detail because it was Gay Talese. And I love telling stories, as you can obviously tell. And when I got all done, he wasn't taking any notes at all. And I said, uh, and uh, I said, I've had calls all week from people telling me I'll never work in town again or that I'm about to get cement over shoes. And uh, I said, other people who hate him who want to hire me, and I've been telling them all to go fuck themselves on both sides. And he says, uh, he says, yep, yeah. he says, that's what happened. And I said, well, yeah, that's what happened. I said, but how do you know I'm telling you the truth? He says, because I was there say what he was part of the entourage he had been following sinatra around for a month doing that famous piece which became right. frank sinatra has a cold though never speaking with sinatra to least cast light on the singer's mercurial personality and internal turmoil the story also detailed sinatra's relationship with his children and former wives nancy barbato and ava gardner through a series of scenes and anecdotes focusing on the people surrounding Sinatra, the article reveals the inner workings of the climate-controlled biosphere the singer had constructed around himself, and the inhospitable atmosphere coalescing outside its shell. 
The article ends with a passage indirectly demonstrating Sinatra's unquenchable thirst to remain relevant. Frank Sinatra stopped his car. The light was red. Pedestrians passed quickly across his windshield, but as usual, one did not. It was a girl in her twenties. She remained at the curb staring at him. Through the corner of his left eye, he could see her. And he knew, because it happened almost every day, that she was thinking, it looks like him, but is it? Just before the light turned green, Sinatra turned towards her, looked directly into her eyes, waiting for the reaction he knew would come. It came, and he smiled. She smiled, and he was gone. Another year would pass, and Sinatra was still no closer resolving the issue regarding what to show and what not to show regarding Sinatra's much-publicized life. Shabon would tell Vulture magazine that the project was dead. Scorsese would now instead throw himself into bringing The Irishman to the screen. Hollywood began to break the news that Martin Scorsese had now officially exited the long-promised Frank Sinatra biopic. We can't do it, Scorsese told the Toronto Sun. I think it is finally over. Sinatra's estate won't agree to it. Open it up again and I'm there. Certain things are very difficult for a family and I totally understand, but if they expect me to be doing it, they can't hold back certain things. I'm still hoping you'll make that Sinatra movie one day. Uh, one one day, I one hope. Day. Come, on. <laughs> Come on. Give him the rights to the estate, guys. <laughs> I'm a fan. I saw him when I was four. I want you to make oh, a movie. Oh, no, I'd love to. I know. I'd okay. The problem is that the man was so complex. Everybody is so complex, but Sinatra in particular. And that was that. Martin Scorsese's Sinatra had fell apart, and cineasts would be left to only imagine how the director's lens intended to capture Sinatra's essence. Frank Sinatra will probably always remain a subject of controversy. Books continue to get published. A mixture of truths and exaggerations will forever circulate. And of course, Mario Puzo is said to have characterized him in The Godfather. Of Sinatra's artistry, however, there is little debate or divide. And the more than 1,400 recordings made during more than 50 years as a performer are regarded by many critics as the most important body of work in American popular vocal music. Almost single-handedly, Sinatra redefined singing as a means of personal expression. In the words of critic Jean Lees, Sinatra learned how to make a sophisticated craft sound as natural as an intimate conversation or personal confession. Beneath the myth and the swagger lay an instinctive musical genius and consummate entertainer. Through his life and his art, he transcended the status of mere icon to become one of the most recognizable symbols of American culture. And it's very fair to suggest that the Rat Pack helped make Vegas what it was. It's all gone now. In 1996, they demolished the sands to make way for yet another mega resort. As for Scorsese, both Sinatra and Dino take their place on an endless list of unrealized Martin Scorsese projects that include unmade biopics of George Washington, Theodore Roosevelt, George Harrison, Mike Tyson, serial killer Dr. Henry Howard Holmes, the tragic 20th century painter Amodego Mordegliani, and the Ramones. Thankfully, when it comes to a legendary director and rightfully idolized master of cinema like Scorsese, for every film that doesn't get made, there's always one that does. Currently showing no signs of slowing down the pace, the director is currently producing some of the greatest work of his career, and one generation after the next continues to discover his work. Here's hoping it may long continue. Thanks for listening.